Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to our Introduction to Construction Management course. In today's lecture, we are going to be looking at regulatory compliance requirements in construction. And this is lecture 6A, the first of two parts. The second part, we will discuss uh, safety regulations in more detail and the uh, Standards Act, Employment Standards Act. So we'll be getting into a lot of the regulatory requirements. You may have learned about uh, a lot of these requirements in the residential construction technology class already, so think of this as somewhat of a refresher in that, that way. Uh, as well, it'll add other context to it. So uh, this image here, you can kind of see this builder, I kind of noticed uh, when I was doing one of my uh, walks, uh, took it upon themselves to actually sort of uh, format this really clearly, get a big board printed up with all of the permits nicely spread out on it. Um, their um, uh, safety requirements as far as access to a hospital, some of the safety instructions as well. Uh, so it's very, very well organized that way. So if they run their construction project anyway, anywhere near the way they, they kind of do their signage, it's probably giving you a good indication of really good planning and organization and thought in the process. And I think those are little things that sometimes you see how somebody operates their business and it can mean uh, some pretty um, good things along the way. I kind of noted when I, and not to promote any particular company, but I kind of noted over time as they were constructing this project, it was very kept organized, very neat, very clean. Um, so always good to see that uh, in process as opposed to some other ones, which is kind of, <laughs> we'll leave that to some photos later, maybe where I'll do it in a different lecture of, uh, unorganization on construction. Okay, so yeah, this isn't from War of the Worlds or anything. This is actually um, a pump truck. Uh, it's pumping concrete for a foundation over here. Just a nice little image I thought I could uh, throw in there, but uh, sometimes construction equipment, it can give <laughs> some different kind of uh, views to things. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at building regulations, building codes, and planning and development uh, compliance requirements. And so we have to think about a number of regulatory requirements. And to be honest, there's a lot of regulatory requirements involved in construction. And it is why uh, there's big lobby groups with various associations in construction that really sort of try to push uh, let's say the political authorities to try to limit the amount of regulations. At the same time, there's things that happen that cause problems. And then, so you have the voting public and uh, politicians which recognize things aren't quite right. And in the different areas, regulatory authorities, uh, advancements in certain areas that change these regulations. And over time, they do tend to become a little bit more complex to be sure, uh, but they're there for a purpose, they're there for a reason, and um, what you have to do if you're going to be in the construction business is learn to understand the regulatory requirements and how to navigate your way through them. So when we think about uh, regulatory requirements, uh, there's the land uh, use planning. So every municipality and there's provincial plans that also have to be coordinated with um, determine what their land use planning is for going forward. Usually 20, 25 years forward, a master plan, or the, in this case, the Toronto official plan uh, for what the plans are for um, various areas. And so, you know, certain areas will be designated a certain way, um, whether it's going to be commercial use, residential use, in light industrial use, heavy industrial use. Uh, so they're really sort of um, planned out a certain way in advance, especially vacant lands and areas. You're not gonna to find too many vacant areas and lands in Toronto, but that doesn't mean there's not areas that they've served their highest and best use and the city knows that this is not going to be redeveloped the way its existing use was. So there may be some context in the planning process to see a change in zoning take place. Uh, so Liberty Village, King Street Dufferin, over the decades, it's really transformed into a sort of a vibrant kind of uh, residential area from a industrial area. And so that involved uh, a lot of remediation, brownfield sites being changed, uh, a lot of uh, adaptations uh, and 
closure of some existing businesses at some point. They tended to be leaving and then that opened up space. Uh, in a new area, perhaps a, a city like Brampton or uh, New Market, there's still wide swaths where there's farmer's fields and things of that nature that haven't quite switched over. So that would be in their planning processes and their official plan for the future as to what they see that being designated at. Um, which is important, all right? And so, and usually when you see these acts uh, and you look them up, they usually have these older dates uh, that are assigned to them. That doesn't mean nothing has been done to them since those dates, but that's when they were enacted or major change took place. Um, so uh, just because you may see an older date on something, especially when you get to the Employment Standards Act and things like that, uh, you'll see that, but doesn't mean it hasn't been evolving uh, ongoing. And so the Planning Act requires the municipality to create their own official plans and zoning bylaws for land development. So that's giving authority to the uh, municipalities to do that. And it also governs land divisions, subdivisions, severances, site plannings, the things that we would have talked about in chapter five, uh, chapter five of your textbook, Understanding Construction Drawings, and when we talked in the other course, Residential Construction Technology, on uh, site plans and how the sites are developed as a result of that. And highest and best use is playing into that. So we keep hearing that term come up over and over again because it really is a driver for that. And this is sort of setting the opportunities and also the limitations. And within those limitations, what perhaps can be uh, change to benefit the developer, all right? So we have the official plan, we have zoning bylaws, we have site plan control and the plan of the subdivision. Uh, I took this, actually, I took this picture. I was out for a walk early this morning and um, I noticed, uh, and it's not surprising to me. So this is um, a condominium development that's going up by Concord ADAX, which is uh, between Bayview and Leslie, south of Shepherd, and the back of this uh, is right at the 401. If I brought my camera up a little bit, I would you would have seen the 401 back there. And so they've got a variance, and uh, we've talked about variance in the other course, but of course a, a variance is a change to the zoning requirements. And they put in to increase the number of stories of the West Tower from 15 to 18 and the East Tower from, from 26 to 29 stories. And the date is about a month ago, right? So um, you look at, because uh, it's now October in that same year. So we look at that and we see that there is that um, change that's taking place. And yet they've already dug the foundation. They're already put in the raft slab. They've already got pilings in and, and caissons in uh, and they've got the crane up. Um, yet they're asking to put more floors. So in their intention, they would have designed the capacity for the substructure of this building going with the hope that they're going to be successful at this. And you might question, well, why didn't they do it prior to? And it, it's a lengthy process. And there's also a little bit of strategy and tactics that's involved with the various developers uh, that they see opportunities. So um, it's a, it's a, it's a way of reviewing it and there's a lot of expertise in this particular area that, that looks at things and strategizes what would we be successful at, what can we get out of this, and what's our most likely um, pathway to get there. And then there's probably some things occurred along the way and then tactically this looked like it's a pretty good opportunity. Um, honestly, it is backing up onto the 401 and, if I, and it's not that far from the subway and there's no low-rise residential around it. Uh, they have had to provide a lot of parkland around this in uh, this uh, development so does make sense in some ways to um, have more density in this particular area so i think we'll see i think that they probably have a pretty good chance at this um, but we'll see how the municipal uh, municipalities look at this and if it doesn't succeed they can always go to the ontario municipal board um, or the newest form of it, the Ontario Municipal uh, Board, which is basically the appealing process. All right, so um, you do have um, the official plans. Uh, planning allows the public uh, to play a key role in that, so they're involved in it. You wanna make sure that there's buy-in to it. Politicians especially are, are conscious of that aspect of it. 
of it. And of course, there's city planners that are hired and they're core, um, core government workers and that's, this is their career and they understand the advantages and disadvantages and how things should be enacted and, and zoned and planned. Uh, but then there's also a lot of interference that gets run between developers, between the public, between the politicians. So it is a little bit of a, a quagmire in this process, if you will. So um, in consideration of each application for land development, the approval authority evaluates the merit of each proposal, conformity with the official plan, compatibility with adjacent uses of land. That's why when I mentioned the, where those condominiums are going, you know, what's right next to it? What's beside it? You know, it's backing up onto the 401. Nobody's too worried about shadows on the 401. Uh, it's uh, in front of a, a park that was put in specifically because of the development. Uh, there's a community center being built nearby. There's a subway nearby. Uh, there is some housing um, in proximity to one of the buildings, so there would be some issues potentially there, but it is not really like it's in the middle. It's really a separation. So compliance with local zoning bylaws, well, it doesn't comply. That's why they have to put in a variance. Uh, suitability of the land for the proposed purpose, including the size, shape of the lot being created, adequacy of vehicular access. Uh, so, um, you know, there would have to be uh, plans in place to look at traffic, traffic control plans. Uh, how is this uh, subdivision or how is this uh, condominium development going to affect traffic in the area? And so there'd be planning studies that would be done uh, that would be required as part and parcel of that. What falls apart a little bit with some of this is, well, one developer does a planning study for this, but do they take into account all the other developments that are going up and coming up? And sometimes there's a bit of confusion in that process uh, that, that occurs too. So it's not a perfect system, but it is a system. The need to ensure protection from potential flooding. And uh, if you read chapter five, you'll get more information on uh, that, but basically to ensure that these buildings that are being built or these houses that are being built are not going to flood out a neighborhood community because of changes in grading and that they've been designed to be able to handle and control uh, rainwater and floodwaters that may occur because of 100 year worst storms, which we've discussed previously. Uh, so a zoning bylaw uh, controls the use of land. Uh, most municipalities have uh, comprehensive uh, zoning bylaws, especially any kind of municipality of any kind of size uh, will have that. and. Uh, some of the more rural ones may be a little, not in GTA, but going really far outside. Uh, they don't have the um, cost infrastructure, the tax base or that to have anything too um, complicated, but they definitely have uh, zoning requirements. Where buildings and other structures can be located, the types, the lot sizes. Um, this is one of uh, Vancouver. You know, Vancouver is like another city. Like if you've ever been to Vancouver, it's kind of like, access in and out of Vancouver is not easy. You're going over like the Lionsgate Bridge. It, it, traffic is pretty intense. A lot of building up high uh, because of uh, the density and because of the attractiveness of that city. So um, they struggle a lot with uh, um, zoning and uh, density and housing and a lot of things because it's a very attractive city to live in and there's a lot of net migration uh, to it. So that's one of the things that helps make it a vibrant city, but at the same time, it makes it um, tricky to actually control development in a way that is sustainable and that keeps that city attractive. Toronto, similar problems, right? Similar problems. Um, land use planning, so site plan control and making sure that the site is um, addressing things such as the layout, um, shadow lines, uh, parking, landscaping, all of these things come into site plan approval. Things like the, the lighting on the parking, things like uh, the ventilation from underground parking and fans and noise and all of those things come into site plan control and ensuring that uh, it's properly landscaped and there's a landscape plan, et cetera, for it uh, based on what new development is going to um, go in. So it's not a free reign by any means for any kind of developer on this. There's a lot of approvals in the process uh, that they need to do. And of course, 
dividing up the site as we've discussed in the residential course is important as well and trying to maximize the value um, in that process. So the building code really is uh, to ensure safety and the in the textbook, the understanding construction textbook that I use, you know, that I've written, uh, I refer constantly to the national building code. And the only reason I do that is because it's across Canada and the national building code is the model code for Canada. The Ontario building code though is the code for Ontario. So it is the code that you utilize when we're building in Canada. Sometimes the national building code comes into use where it's maybe a federal property or there's some other jurisdictional issue. I've seen where some buildings, part of the building is national building code and part of it's Ontario building code. Uh, that was true for the uh, George Brown College waterfront campus. Uh, so there are some of the, these crossovers. I would say that for the most part, um, they're in sync with each other. So it's not like they're radically different documents, but there are differences. And there's particularly differences in energy efficiency requirement sustainability, energy efficiency requirements, which has over the last 15 to 20 years grown to be more significant in our building code designs and layout. Um, so it, we're really fundamentally, we're looking at um, uh, a building code as looking at safety for the users. And um, the one that has sort of crept in is also energy efficiency to make Canada overall, Ontario in our case, uh, a more energy efficient, less dependent uh, country on carbon-based fuels. So uh, we have the in Ontario, the uh, Building Code Act, and it governs, governs all of these particular areas. There's a bunch of divisions to the building code uh, that uh, have specific applications like um, part 11 is for renovations and it'll say what if you're renovating a building well how far do I have to go to bring this building up to today's standards because what the standards were 15 20 years ago is quite different uh, than what the standards are now and so you have to with innovation and change you have to say okay well you're renovating this how much of it do you have to bring up to these standards. And it depends on the use of the building, it depends on the extent of the renovation, but part 11 gives guidelines as to what that means and what parts of the code in the area have to be updated. Part nine, as we're familiar, is housing and small buildings, three stories or less. And then so that we understand is in the residential framework. Part three is gonna get into engineering for specific um, uses and those requirements. And so there's really a number of sections of the building code that work for different areas, depending on what you're doing, and different sections, like the plumbing code uh, is in the building code. Electrical code is not in the building code, it's a separate standard onto its own. Um, so basically, but the building code refers to that standard. So that's all it has to do is refer to that standard and then that standard becomes part of what is required when you're doing uh, any kind of building or renovation. So it's all interconnected that way. And the building code, by the way, is usually updated about every five years. We haven't got the 2020 code out and this is the Ontario building code. Uh, we had the 2020 code should be should be out, I think it's probably delayed now with, with uh, the pandemic. It should be, usually it comes out at the very end of whatever the year is. And then the Ontario Building Code takes a year or two beyond that to be updated um, from that. So there's usually this delay. If it, if it comes out with a totally new version or they just have, because the Building Code, regardless of um, the Building Code version, um, it has constant updates. So it's just because you, the last one's 2015, say for the National Building Code, it's had you know, several dozen or more updates to it. So they just become, if you register when you get the building code, they send you the updates. So you're always up to date uh, with what's coming out. So the Ontario Building Code, as I mentioned, focuses on safety, um, sets out objectives, requirements for new construction, provide standards for existing building and establishes qualification and registration registration requirements. I just want to get back to the building code act. It really gives the authority um, 
to uh, the authorities having jurisdiction to inspect building and buildings and establish uh, property standard bylaws. So there's a lot of authority that's provided through the Building Code Act. And in fact, it's surprising how much authority uh, the municipalities have uh, with regards to um, the act. For example, you know, some homeowners think oh, they come to my door, I'm not going to let them in. I'm doing what I want inside my house. It's none of their business. They can't come in. Well, you know what? They have authority. They can get uh, the authority to come in and check your property. Uh, so there's a lot in there. It's almost like a search warrant that they can actually, if they need to, get access to the property um, to look into it, right? So it's not something that is taken lightly from that perspective. They also have the authority to stop work on the property. So if you're doing work, they can say you must stop until X, Y, Z is satisfied. Uh, for example, if you start working, you didn't get a permit, they can stop it. So as I was mentioning, there's this sort of crossover with the environmental integrity, safety, and sustainability and uh, environmental integrity of our buildings. And this has become uh, much more of a part of the building code requirements, especially over the last 15, 20 years, I would say. When I look at major changes to the building code every time, uh, this is playing a bigger and bigger and more substantial role as we move towards net zero um, requirements for our building code building uses as much energy as it produces. Uh, and of course, uh, the prime purpose uh, is protection of people, as we mentioned, safety. Accessibility is another big one. Uh, with um, If uh, somebody is uh, impaired that they can't um, get access to a building, that's where we have wheelchair ramps. That's where we have elevators. And there's there's retroactive things that are being done in the city and there's anything that's new that has to be done to comply with accessibility. And what was accessible, accessibility requirements 20 years ago uh, have been advanced to what accessibility requirements are today. So they're, they're always changing and evolving to make our buildings much more streamlined and accessible. If you're a student at George Brown College, uh, I always find it kind of interesting. Um, the maybe when we get back after uh, pandemic uh, issues, maybe they'll just have the elevator system in at DuPont Station. Uh, the subway system was built uh, in the mid 70s. Uh, the DuPont Station, I believe, was around mid 70s. And uh, no elevators, no elevators. And so how, how if, you, if you are um, barrier free access and you can't, so if you have a wheelchair, how do you, how do you get up from DuPont Station. You don't, like it's, it's, it's a problem, right? Uh, so they've been putting in this uh, elevator system. But what's kind of interesting for me with that particular example, it's taken them about five years to put in this, this elevator. Um, so I don't know what schedule they've been working on, but it's, and it's not that they've left it, they've been working on it steady. So um, it just is kind of uh, amusing for me how long this has actually been taking. But definitely the move is towards accessibility and anything new must comply. There's also another area that goes beyond these standards which what we call barrier free access design and that's another um, sort of new sort of way and view of looking at our buildings. Well why can't we make our buildings more barrier free access when we talk about low-rise residential uh, and is, what things can we include in the design to make it more easy or to more convertible uh, especially as we have an aging population. Uh, it's very difficult in some houses to um, make it easy for somebody to access the second floor if all of a sudden um, they become that they can't access it, they can't go upstairs easily, etc. So these are all part and parcel of some of the changes that are taking place and some, a number of these changes be eventually become part of the building code. Uh, provincial, so the building code, so the province is responsible for the act and the building code, what the details are. There's participation from uh, chief building officials committee, uh, TACBOC, Toronto area chief building officials committee, heads of the building departments in the various um, municipalities participate. And then the responsibility of enforcement is turned over to 
those areas like Toronto, like Brampton, like Mississauga to enforce the act, right? And to try to enforce it in a uniform way. So that's why you have Toronto Area Beef, uh, um, Chief Building Officials Committee, TACBOC, because they try to coordinate that there's some consistency between the municipalities of how you enforce it. No matter what, with a building code, as much as you try to make it in absolutes, there's always some little touchy gray areas uh, that need uh, clarification. And it's good when it's kind of interpreted consistently across the municipality. An example might be railings. The building code says the railing should be, not be climbable. So how do you determine what's climbable? You know, is, the, is your kid really good uh, at climbing stuff or is the kid not so interested in climbing stuff? So how do you determine climbable? And that could be interpreted different ways. So these are some of the kind of gray areas that always get a little bit touchy with things. Uh, building regulation, so yeah, states that it's the role of every person who causes a building to be constructed to be constructed in accordance with the building code. That's your responsibility and that's the requirements, right? And to ensure that uh, construction is carried out only by persons with qualifications and insured insurance requirements by the building code. So for example, one of the things would be to make sure, uh, I thought I had added a couple of little lines here, but maybe it didn't show up. Um, carry on warranty. All right. So if you're going to build a new house, you have to be a licensed builder with carry on warranty. They're not going to give you a permit for that house unless you are a certified builder or unless it's your own house. All right. Uh, unless they've changed something recently. If it was your own house, you didn't have to be a certified uh, builder. Or they're also going to make sure that you are a registered um that you are registered and licensed as an electrician. So there's requirements that if you're going to be a subcontractor in a compulsory um, regulated trade, and I think I had a mistake in one of my earlier lectures in one of the slides, one of you pointed that out. Compulsory regulated trades are trades like electrician, like plumber, sheet metal. A voluntary regulated trade is like carpenter, brick and stone mason, drywall. So the areas that you would have to have licensing would be in the compulsory regulated trades. And most of those subcontractors have to have what they call a master electrician or master plumbing license. Uh, and then there's even local trade licensing, municipal licensing requirements in those areas. Like the city of Toronto has a renovator license that you have to apply. If you're going to run a renovation company, you have to be licensed in that particular area. Is everybody licensed in that area? I sincerely doubt it, uh, but they're supposed to be in that municipality. So there's municipal licensing that ties to those particular areas as well. Uh, the Terion warranty, though, has a lot of teeth. So that one, you better be licensed or you could end up in jail. Uh, the building code enforcement. So the municipalities enforce it. They issue the building codes, uh, building permits. So they're in charge of that. So they're in charge of the inspections and stop work orders. Uh, if there's uh, prosecutions that have to be made, that they will take care of that. So that's the municipal's role and um, they're responsible for enforcing the Ontario Building Code. So, why do you need it? Well, we've kind of discussed it, but with regards to um, safety, with regards to access to expertise, it sets the standards. There's been a lot of knowledge that's been built up and gathered over the decades to ensure that our buildings are safe. It's why in the developed world, we have safe buildings. It's why, you know, Canada, the United States overall, we have very safe buildings. Uh, most of Europe has very safe buildings as a result to building regulatory requirements. Uh, if that wasn't, it'd be sort of an ad hocracy and things would be very chaotic and very messy. Uh, so at least we have certain standards that we meet from that perspective and people aren't willy nilly going off and doing whatever they want to do. So there is these requirements. I'll leave this, you know, you can pause this if you want and take a look at this. In the next uh, few slides, you can sort of pause. I'll hold them for a second. I don't think I want to go through them. 
um, individuals piece by piece, but I think you, you can see what that is, or you can also read chapter five of the textbook and you'll see where that is too, uh, the various permits. And again, this is uh, just some examples of permits. They go beyond this, uh, but you see on some of the photos that I'll show, uh, that I showed that, you know, demolition permit, if you're de demolishing something, plumbing permit, there's what's missing is the electrical permit um, that has to be um, taken out as well. Uh, so there are the requirements. Uh, so these are some of the things and items that you have to keep in mind. Of course, if you're demolishing a building, then it's got to be deemed to be safe. Uh, it would have to be remediated for things like asbestos and mold prior to demolition. So it just doesn't go up into the local area. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of requirements within all of um, these areas that come to the forefront. Good list to sort of get an idea. And then usually you don't have to get a permit for these types of things, uh, chimney repairs, uh, window door replacements, uh, unless you're enlarging it. If you're enlarging it, then structural, right? You're opening the opening wider, then you need to put a lintel and the lintel is probably going to have to be sized up properly for the opening that you're putting in. And then that needs to be verified that it's carrying the loads properly, etc. So you can usually follow these things through anything that would have applied to the building code. Uh, typically, then it's got some sort of structural orient orientation will require a permit. But if you're re-roofing, you're taking off asphalt shingles and you're re-roofing with asphalt shingles, that's probably not going to be an issue. Uh, you may have to get some structural engineering done on the roof if you're taking off a roof like an asphalt shingle and you're putting like a concrete tile roof. Well, is the capacity of the structure capable of carrying that dead load weight? Um, so in a case like that, you may have to get something analyzed and shored up to be able to take that extra weight if it can even be done simply. This list I think uh, you would have had in your CMHC um, wood frame construction book from the residential uh, course. It gives an example of the listing of typical inspections. I would always defer to when you get a permit, it'll give you a list and make sure whatever you do, you comply with those inspections. Do not miss an inspection because that means later on that inspector can come and tell you to uncover whatever you covered up. Big problem. And plus, if I'm the inspector, now you're on my, you know, on my um, to-do list to really watch you closely because now I don't trust the work you do. Why did you cover it up? What are you trying to hide? So you want to make sure that you comply with what the requirements are. Inspections can happen anytime, but they must happen at certain times. And your permit will specifically tell you what those requirements are and when you're supposed to have it. And before anybody occupies a building, you got to make sure that you have an occupancy permit. Um, some things like uh, some renovations and things like that, sure, the people can live in there. But if it's a new building or structure, uh, then there's a requirement for occupancy and make sure that you comply with that. Or if the renovation is so extensive that, you know, you've gutted the whole house and you're adding a addition, big addition onto it, then you'll need occupancy before somebody comes back in to live in that um, particular structure. Very important that that is achieved and that that is signed off on for your own protection because later if somebody gets hurt, you want to at least establish that it was inspected, the railings were in and it complied. So as I mentioned, very well organized with this, but I think that's what I wanted to cover in lecture uh, 6A. So we'll be re re returning for lecture uh, 6B, which we'll look at the Safety and uh, the um, Employment Standards Act, Human Rights um, Commission and Code uh, for uh, construction projects, as this has become a really uh, big area of concern in the construction industry. So hopefully that gives you a, another recap or uh, look at uh, the regulatory requirements with planning, with zoning, with the building code permits, and um, some of the reasons that we have those regulations and the importance of them and the importance of complying with them. Codes change constantly, so whenever you're building, make sure that you're complying with the current code requirements with whatever the regulatory authority is. And there's always a transference and a time that you have from one code change to another. So if you're in the middle of something, you may be okay with the existing code, but just make sure that you're following those requirements as well. So I'm Tom Stevenson for now. 
Uh, wishing you a wonderful day, and we'll see you in Lecture 6B soon enough. Have a great day. Bye for now.